gone through. Lord, it's been you.
have a seat? You can. Make yourself at home. And you all joining us online, we hope you're making yourself at home wherever your sweet little self is. My name is Jill, and this is my husband, Jason. Good morning. We love serving here as pastors, and we're yeah. so glad you're spending part of your day with us. Maybe you are new with us. If that is the case, those here, those joining online, we have a really simple way to connect and get to know you. And that is if you would please text new EC. That's for Evangel Church to the number 97,000, and we will do just that. What a beautiful fall morning. It's a little blow, blowy out there. Have you noticed that? It's windy. A little crisp. It's a new way of saying it. I love it. It sure is blowy outside. Yesterday was ridiculous. 50 to mile an hour winds to hold someone just to stay up. But anyway, here we are. I so, love that part. You like the windy part? I, I love oh, the, the holding, holding part. part. Yeah, it feels that's good. right. That's right. That's right. I know. I yeah. like you. That's the only way we'll. Anyway, sorry. Go outside. It's a lot of wind. We hug Where each were other. We going? I don't know. We're going in outside. In the car, we'll find out. And if All you right. want to know, you can ask me later. Right. Um, anyway, the Lord right. just is sparing us right here. Yeah, um, but we have a very exciting outreach coming up, you guys, on Halloween. Halloween is on a Saturday. October 31st is on a Saturday this year. And so there's an outreach from 1 to 3 here. It is a drive through candy extravaganza. And so it's trunk or treat. We need some volunteers and we need you to bring all the littles that you know with you or um, your neighbors, tell them about it, family members, everybody, you know, can be in your own car, however you want to do that in this season. Um, but there will be wonderful entertainment as well as you drive through and get your candy. It's going to be just amazing. So we do need a few more trunks for our trunk or treat, just seven more. And so maybe yours or you online, you want to join the fun. All the details, 
Giles will be coming your way. You just text Halloween to the number 97,000. And we also do need candy. So when you're out maybe purchasing candy for yourself or you say it's for the neighbor kids who will come by um, or you're leaving it on your front porch, whatever it looks like this year, just bring an extra bag of candy with you when you come to church if you would or drop it off sometime during the week and we will make sure it gets into those sweet little cherubs baskets. We know how some of you are. You buy candy and then you're not home that night and then you eat it all yourself. We know how that and works. Fashion. Or you buy extra. That's how it is for us. All right, Jason, come on up here. This is Jason Fisher. He's our missionary, missionary to Woo-hoo. England and uh, we are excited to have him. Now, some of us might be like, why would you need a missionary in England? Spiritually, things are not going great there. So he's going to just share with you some things of, of why we're reinvesting in, in England. So go ahead, Jason, share with us. Well, thank you, Pastor yeah. Jason. Um, back at my home church, I'm Pastor Jason, so this has been a weird day for me. Um, but uh, I'm from uh, St. Louis, been there for about 10 years. My family and I, there's a picture of my family coming up. This is my wife, Sheila, my daughter, Grace. In 2018, God called us to England, um, which was not expected. And like you were saying, we didn't even know, like, well, is there even a need there? Why would we be going to England? But in conversations that we had with missionaries that were there, they were just describing the great spiritual need that was there. Um, one of the things there is that the churches that do exist are very small. Um, they don't have many pastors. The, the, there's a great need for uh, biblical training there. There is a Bible school for the Assemblies of God, but they've put out 10 pastors in 10 years, which isn't enough. <laughs> um, and so there's a great need for, for, for work there. And so we answered the call, and in, uh, in, in last year we transitioned from our worship pastor role in St. Louis and uh, began this process of getting to the field. So this picture you see here is a cathedral in Bristol, England, where we'll be headed, not to this building, but to the city. And when we think of England, we think of churches like this, right? And this is very true. Most uh, cities will have a big ancient cathedral. Um, But how many know that the church isn't a building, the church is people? And there is a body of believers that would meet in buildings like this, but it's not as grand as the building would suggest. It's uh, very much historical. It's funded by the gift shop um, and those kinds of things. A lot of other buildings would look like this, this next picture. The one on the left is for sale. Uh, Many, many, many church buildings have been sold to become pubs, uh, to become housing, to become mosques, to become whatever would the building can be used for because it can no longer be used as a church because there's not enough people that would attend there. The one on the right is now the Hindu Temple of St. Louis, or I'm sorry, not of St. Louis, sorry, of Bristol. I've been to the Hindu Temple of St. Louis. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm all for freedom of religion. That's their right to worship that way. But my soul is grieved that a building that was once dedicated to worshiping our Lord and Savior is now dedicated to worshiping idols because the body of believers that once met there has died. And so God's called us to help, to do our best, to, to make disciples, to train, um, to train leaders. And if you look at the next uh, slide, you'll see the number of missionaries that our organization, the Assemblies of God World Missions, has in the United Kingdom. The UK is four different countries, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England. And you can see the populations there, and you can see the number of missionaries there. Um, in England, which is by far the most populous, only has one missionary unit there right now. The upside of that is that when we arrive, we have to double the number of missionaries in England. So it's a good investment. Um, and the family that's there is the Parks family. They've planted a church about uh, five years ago. It's going really well. Of course, this year with COVID, it's crazy. But um, they've, they've been able to influence their community and to plant a healthy church that was so desperately needed in Bristol. Um, but when the, the Assemblies of God of Great Britain asked them to become a zone leader to help with other churches in their area. And when they emailed them that, they said, we're going to need you to visit these 15 churches because we're not sure how many are still open. That was their invitation to help with other churches. And so, but they've planted a church. They have a church that they're already working with. So it's hard for them to help these other churches on Sunday mornings. So they've asked us to help the other churches in their zone um, so that we can train worship leaders, we can, we can make disciples, we can uh, circuit preach, just do our best to bring health to these other communities, churches that don't have a pastor right now. Many of them don't have pastors. So these are our goals for our first term. 
we got to learn the culture and the context. Although we basically understand the language, there's about 1,500 differences in vocabulary between American English and British English, and uh, humor is completely different. And so if we want to communicate the gospel effectively, we have to just live there long enough to absorb the culture. Um, secondly, we're going to assist churches, like I've already mentioned. And thirdly, we're going to discern our future involvement. We, we know God's called us there, but we don't know long-term exactly what we'll be doing because we expect that as we're there, we're working with the churches, working there, God's going to reveal to us if we're going to be staying in the Bristol area, if God's calling us to another city in England that needs help, but that's what we'll be doing. So I just want to share uh, one quick just testimony of God's provision and protection with you. Um, it, on, on August 31st, which is a Monday, we were coming home to St. Louis from weekend of ministry at other churches in Missouri. And on Interstate 44, during a bad storm, our truck hydroplaned, rolled twice, and we ended up in the center median. And it was very scary. We were all together. We were hurt, but we didn't seem to be uh, injured too bad. We called 911, and we couldn't tell them where we were. They asked, well, where are you, so we can send workers. We couldn't tell them. We didn't know where we were. There's no mile markers that we could see. But then they said, oh, uh, are you in the Dodge Durango? And we said, yes. They said, okay, well, somebody called it, and we know where you're at. Fast forward to the next day, uh, we were home, we were sore, we didn't have a truck, <laughs> um, we were really, really disappointed, um, and we had shared on Facebook that, hey, we had been in an accident, please pray for us. Well, one of our pastor friends contacted us, uh, another pastor in Missouri, and he said, were you on Interstate 44 between these two cities? And we said, yeah. He said, I was the one that witnessed your accident. I was coming the opposite direction on 44 in very poor visibility. I saw you roll twice and land much softer than you should have. We pulled over, we called it in, and we were praying for you until the emergency workers arrived. Now, the chance that the one person that witnessed our accident was one of our supporting pastors, who was probably 50 miles from home, it just proved us that God knew where we were at. And I just want to encourage you, this, this year may have felt like a, a slow car accident all year <laughs> that you've just been watching happen over and over, and your, your life just keeps rolling over and over. God knows where you're at. He knows where each one of us are at, and he's going to be with you, and uh, he's going to be with us as we go to England. Thank you for your support and your prayers. Thank you. This one? This one's working. I'm going with this, the, this one. Okay, sorry. I'm just saying this one over and over. It's weird. All right, Jason, thank you. Go ahead and stand with me this morning. We're going to just go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, if you don't know, um, we, we give 10% of our general fund to missions. That's how we support missionaries. Uh, then through Kingdom Builders, we support missions projects, and we're able to take you guys on right away. We're super excited about that opportunity. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, we're hearing things about England. We're seeing some stuff, Lord. And, and a lot of times where England goes, where Europe goes, it seems like America's following. And I, I pray that that would not be the case spiritually. Lord, that you would protect us. You would keep the, the flame going, Lord. Us in our individual lives, we would walk with you and, and talk with you and, and, and go about your business in this world. Lord, in our election coming up, Lord, we pray for that. We ask that your will would be done. We, we ask for protection over our country. Lord, we ask that you would go before us as we're making decisions on, on voting and who to vote for from a national levels all the way to local levels, that you would, you would speak clearly to every person individually. And Lord, God, we just ask for, uh, for you to touch America right now. And then, Lord, as we, we pray for Jason and his family, Lord, that you would be with the fishers. You'd give them favor and guidance and direction as they go into Bristol. And then, Lord, from whatever goes on there, that, that you would help them to be a voice in an area that just needs, uh, needs hope right now more than ever before. And Lord, for our, our lives as well, as, as, as Jason shared, it might just be the, the, a terrible situation, a series of events that's happened in our lives. Lord, you are our living hope. You're the one we lean on. We're the one that, that we call upon. Lord God, you are, are not distant. You're not dead. You are alive and you are living and active and breathing in our lives today. And Lord, we pray today as we worship you, that there would be just a tangible expression of that in our own heart, a witness to that of just saying, God, because you're alive, you can help me. And you notice my situation. You see where I am at, Lord. And God, we thank you that you have protected this family and that you'll continue to go with them. Speak life to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I 
The scripture in Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. This next song that we're about to sing speaks of the promises and the faithfulness of God. We've got to trust, church family, we've got to trust in the Lord. That even when it feels like he's not listening or he's not going to do it, we have to trust that he is faithful. That when everyone else is not faithful, that when I can't depend on no one else, I can always depend on my Savior. Hallelujah. And he's always been faithful throughout the ages. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And we just can trust in him. So trust in him today. And think about his faithfulness as we sing this song. Hallelujah.
Oh, church, let him hear your praise. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. You are faithful. We praise you, God, that you never let us down, that you are faithful. God, may we see that. May we know that to the deepest parts that need to know that. Lord, those in this room, those joining online, Father, you know all about it. And, and Father, you allow things to happen and you are with us and you bring victory and you see us through the end, whatever that may be. And we can trust you to be loving and faithful and true and kind. We thank you, God. Lord, with this time that we have today, would you speak? Would you continue to minister to the hearts of every single one of us? We need you, Lord, and our world needs you and that love that we have. Empower us and use us, God. We pray that this would be your time, especially to do what you have planned and purpose to do for your glory alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Hey, good morning, everybody. It feels like church today, doesn't it? Just kind of look around. This feels better than usual. <laughs> Anyways, uh, good morning. My name's Todd. Please don't boo me for wearing the jersey. The Chiefs are my second favorite team, and I assure you tomorrow I will be wearing a Chiefs t-shirt. Okay, just so you know, last time I got booed for wearing this, so... Thank you for maturing. And, I'm kidding. So, all right. So, hey, this is a chance we have in the service to worship God in a tangible, sacrificial, and a biblical way uh, through giving a tithe, which is 10% of what we make back to God, and then also through an offering. So just a quick PSA. Uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I can speak for certainly myself and a good majority of the staff. We feel uh, very supported and very encouraged by you. If you'd like to give in the offering, mark your gift, Pastor Appreciation, and they'll make sure that gets designated where it needs to go. Um, however, next week, you won't want to miss service because Mary Beth, she's one of our Rockstar board members. Uh, she'll be sharing in the offering, and she'll be giving a little more clear direction in regards to that. So multiple ways to give. You'll see it on the screen behind me. You can do so online, uh, the church app, the church website. Uh, as you leave today, if you're here in person, you can give us a bucket as you leave. Or if you want to text the amount, uh, there's the number on the screen, and you can follow those prompts. So a quick little exercise, we're not like exercise, but figuratively speaking, we're going to do a little exercise, a 10-question quiz that I would like all of us to participate in. And the purpose of this quiz is to generate gratitude and thankfulness, okay? So I'm going to ask 10 questions in about 52 seconds, and I want you to give some sort of affirmation like, Yes, I identify with that, or nod your head, or say amen, or clap, or something like that, but we're going to go through this real fast, okay? And again, the purpose of the quiz is, is to generate gratitude and thankfulness, okay? So question number one, how many of you have a job? Okay, not saying you like it, but you have a job. Number two, how many of you own more than one pair of shoes? Okay, so for Pastor Ryan, the question would be 40, and he would probably still raise his hand, because Pastor Ryan, he likes his shoes. Okay, number three, uh, how many of you have more than a week, a week's worth of food in your fridge or your pantry? Okay, number four, how many of you have a spare fridge or, ref or freezer in your garage or basement? Okay, number five, how many of you have a spare bedroom in your apartment or your home? Okay, number six, how many of you have more cars at home than you have drivers at home? Okay, number seven, how many of you have health insurance? I'm not saying you have good coverage or you like your coverage, but you have it. Okay, number eight, uh, how many of you are in relatively good health? I mean, you're mobile, you can taste, you can smell, you can hear, you can touch. If you can't taste or smell, go get checked, okay? Number nine, how many of you have at least one good friend? Okay, and lastly, number 10, and I hope that you two say yes or raise your hands, how many of you enjoy the church that you attend? All right, very good, very good. So that was a painless quiz. Uh, some of you may have been able to answer yes to all 10 of those questions, or maybe you're batting 500, or maybe you're feeling, I don't know, just a little bad about yourself, and you can say, you know what, I could only answer yes to one or two of those. The point of this is to be thankful for what we have and not focused on what we don't have. And the point of this little exercise is to, to suggest to you that we have what I would call First world blessings and luxuries. 
and to simply acknowledge that God is the giver of all good gifts. Would you agree with that? So it says in Psalm chapter 52, it says, The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies God. And I firmly believe that thanksgiving is a precursor to generosity. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for what you have given us. Uh, we live uh, really just a blessed life. And we're thankful for that, Lord. We acknowledge that. We don't feel bad or guilty for that. But Lord, we acknowledge that you are the giver of gifts and all good things. Lord, you've been generous with us, and we in turn want to be generous with you, Lord. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just two quick housekeeping things real quick. Uh, number one, if you want to follow along in sermon notes today, uh, just hop on the Evangel app, click the Kansas City campus, and then sermon notes. And then number two, if you or any of the kids that you brought with you get a little squirrely during service today, uh, we do have some family rooms that pipe the service in live, so if you Go to one of those, you won't miss the service at all. Just flag down an usher, and they'll point you in the right direction. So it is Pastor Appreciation Month, and Pastor Jason, I appreciate you. Just want you to know that. Thanks. All Thanks right, here he goes. I really want to make a snarky comment about your jersey, but I won't since you just said that. But I had one lined up. I'll tell it to you privately. All right, just kidding. Thanks, Pastor Todd. All right, so do you guys remember that uh, game called Operation, maybe when you were little? You had some guy like in a loincloth on a, like this guy, and, and then you're like picking out his organs for some reason, trying to get them all out without the buzzer going. And then if, if you didn't do it, it'd be a zzz, and then you, his nose would light up. You guys remember that? If those were made today, like you'd get a shot of electricity through you. My brother has a game where the light, when the light stops, you all hit a buzzer, and the last one to hit it gets like, a massive jolt of electricity, but, but I kind of want to just uh, equate that to you and me for a second. We all have offenses in our life, and if the right person hits you at the right moment with the right word, your nose would light up like Rudolph, and you would buzz, kind of just going all the things that would cause quite a reaction. So we're in a series called The Other Side of Offense, and we're looking at, at offenses in our life. And in Matthew 24, the disciples approach Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, what will be the sign of your return? What will be the sign of the, the end of time? And Jesus gives them a, a bunch of things. He says, you know, many will come in my name. Uh, many will come saying I'm the Christ and many will be deceived. And he talks about, as we talked about in a message this summer, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise up against nation. There'll be earthquakes and in diverse places, disease, pestilence. And it's easy to focus on the earthquake part, the disease part, especially right now, the disease part, but there's an interesting verse in there that I had kind of missed in all this. Here, look at this, what it says, verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Your version might say, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. The, the reason to turn away because of, of offense. There's kind of the underlying tone, the original language. There's going to be a great offense in the last day. The culture is going to be offended. People will be offended by God, by the things of God, by one another, and the result will be betrayal and hatred. And, and Jesus is telling us one of the signs is that culture will be greatly offended by so many things. I think we could all say we see that in our world today. So we're, we're in a series where we're taking one point a week in this story. First time I've ever kind of preached this way. I'm kind of in, enjoying it so far. But where a woman is walking through a series of opportunities where there is potentially great offense. And we'll just briefly look back on it and, and encourage you to, to listen to the other messages if you've mit, missed them. But Jesus is acting in a very uncharacteristic way. So I want to give you a little bit of background as to why and a little bit of historical background as to, to what was happening. Matthew 15, it says this, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile, a Canaanite woman who lived there, came to him. So Tyre and Sidon, if we could put a map up, are, are located you know, north or whatever direction, east, west, anyway, I won't get into all that, of Jerusalem. And there are two Phoenician cities located on the Mediterranean coast. And if you study the Old Testament, you find you know, that's the area where the Phoenicians were when, when they came into the land of Canaan, and all the people in the land of Canaan were called the Canaanites. They had close ties with Israel from David 
to Solomon, to the coming, the following kings. In fact, you might have heard of a lady named Jezebel. We don't name our kids Jezebel pretty much because of this lady. Uh, she was the most evil queen of Israel's history because they had formed an alliance with the Phoenicians, and she married, I think it was, was uh, what was the guy's name? Ahab. Anyway, I don't remember. That sounds like a novel, but anyway, I, I should know that. Ahab and Jezebel. Is that right? Someone tell me. No one knows, and everyone's just looking at me. Okay, all right, good. So over the centuries, because of jealousy and, and race and religion and political alliance, the Jews and the Phoenicians came to actually hate each other. In fact, the first century Jewish historian Josephus wrote this. He said, the people of Tyre are our bitterest enemy. Our, we, we don't like them. We hate them. And Jesus once said about this, on the day of judgment, even Tyre and Sidon, would be better off than the cities that saw his miracles and didn't respond. So what is he doing? He's giving the worst example of the worst people who you wouldn't trust to hold your dirty sock. You know, they're the bottom of the barrel. Even the worst people you could think of, and that would be the Tyre and Sidon people. So this woman is a member of the most spiritually ignorant and evil people that the disciples would know outside of maybe the Samaritan. So her people were the enemies, and Jesus decides... I need a break, so I'm going to go to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he's dragging his disciples with him. And the disciples are always ending up going to places that they don't want to be, meeting people they don't want to meet because they're following Jesus. So she approaches Jesus as pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. <clears throat> she's done her homework here. She's deeply respectful. She, she rec calls him the son of David, basically saying, I know your lineage. I recognize that you're the Messiah. And then it says this, but Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. So in week one, we talked about the offense of being ignored. He ignores her. He pretends he, he doesn't even hear her. And, and, and historically, this would have been absolutely normal behavior for a rabbi. John Ortberg, in his research on this story, found a, found a historical rabbinical statement, which basically, here's what I'm going to put on. This would be translated for us today, that they would have been, the rabbis would have taught one another and taught people. Here's what it said. He that talks with womankind brings evil on himself, neglects the study of the law, and, the, and at the last will inherit Gehenna. That's an encouraging teaching, Right? So rabbis had such an inner circle that they would actually preach this, and it wasn't just about you know, women of other races and, and religion. This was about any woman. To talk to a woman would be to tell the world you don't know the law and hell is in your future. So that's what they, that's what they would teach each other. I'm glad we're in a little different era of time, and, and they, would act, they had actually misinterpreted what God was saying about how they're to treat ladies. But, but Jesus isn't just any rabbi. In fact, when you look at him and follow him, what he's doing with this lady is so out of character, it doesn't even make sense. <clears throat> it's not like him. He's always going to the outcast. In fact, just a few months earlier, he said, we have to go through Samaria, and he talks to a woman publicly at a well in the middle of a day that is outside of the Jewish faith, and he, she becomes his first convert, the first evangelist that comes to, to faith in Jesus. And, and he's breaking all kinds of norms. He had on his team somebody that no one else would have on his team, a hated tax collector, a guy named Matthew. He had a despised Roman just a few weeks earlier stop him on the road, and, and, and they're like, what are you doing talking to this guy in their mind? And Jesus heals his son. So what he does here is, is totally out of character, and, and here's what I think is happening. He is testing his disciples. All right, future leaders of the church, We've done some things that are a little bit on characteristics. I've brought you into some new places. I've met, had you meet people you normally wouldn't be. So I'm going to just be quiet in this moment and see how you handle it. How are you going to handle this situation? I've already modeled it for you like four times. Have you learned anything? So I want to ask you guys the same question. How are you doing? Because the disciples had seen Jesus, heard him, probably said amen, probably like, that was amazing, that was great. Sometimes we will what? We will we'll hear, a, read a passage, or we'll hear a message, we're like, man, that was great, that was fantastic. But what are you doing as it relates to some of the enemies of your life, as it relates to going to places and meeting people that you normally wouldn't meet? Are you like, yeah, that sounds great, but then we walk out the door and forget what we just learned. So the disciples are kind of on a crash course here. Jesus is like, what are you going to do with all the things I just taught you and that Jesus, that's what he's doing. Has any of this sunk in yet? So he's quiet. 
and they quickly fall back into the old patterns that they normally would have done, the old ways of thinking. And then it says this, his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away. She's bothering us with all of her needs and all of her begging. And that's insult number two, which we talked about last week, institutional hurt. What do you do when the people who should be helping you are the ones that hurt you? And we could be, we put, said you fill in the blank, but it was uh, specifically about the church last week. So the Canaanite woman, she could have laughed. She could have said, I knew that's how you would treat me. It's how every rabbi's treated me. It's how every Jewish male's treated me. But she's on a mission, and she has a plan. And she'll not allow herself to be offended in this moment because there's something more important to her. Her daughter has a need, so she's pushing through. And I think Jesus understood this. So like we talked about last week, sometimes we can be just too easily offended. And Scripture said there's going to be offense you're going to walk through life. In fact, the verse scripture we looked at last week, it'll be impossible for you to walk through life and not be offended, not have the opportunity for offense, but we can choose whether to walk down that path and whether to let it destroy our lives, whether to take it with us and always be like, I'm angry at everybody and all these kind of things that we kind of see right now. So she doesn't go anywhere. Send her away. She keeps crying after us. If that was me, ignored by Jesus, hurt by the ones who bear his name. I don't know that I would have stayed for much longer of that conversation, but she stays. And because she stays, God speaks to her. So here's a little point. When you stay in God's presence, he will eventually speak to you. He'll eventually, you know, sometimes it might be not the right answer, not the right things. Now, she, she doesn't like what he's about to say because he's still teaching a lesson, but he's speaking to her. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Robert Madu, who kind of helped us with the outline for this message, says this. Jesus looked at her and said, girl, I ain't here for you. That's what he's saying. I'm sorry about your little daughter, but your urgency is not my emergency. I have another situation that, that is first and foremost on my mind. I am here for the lost sheep of Israel, which leads us to offense number three. When you're made to feel insignificant. You ever had that? You're made to just feel like you're, you're not that important. So in her mind, she had to be thinking, so are you saying I don't matter? I don't, you don't care about me? My girl's not that important to you? This is the offense of insignificance. So insignificance is, is one of those things. We could name it insecurity. We could name it a dump, number of different things that every one of us deals with because we all want to be included. We want to be a part of what's happening. We want to know what's going on. And, and God made us for a community. But one of the, the problems is in that every community, it doesn't matter where, there's always another circle we want to be in, but it feels like we're on the outside looking in. We finally get to the circle we want to be in, and then we're like, I don't know if I like these people as much as I thought they would. They're not a school. I'd rather be in that circle, but I'm not invited to that circle. So how do I get over there? And we have circles of friends, circles of athletes, circles of, of knitters, you know, circles of readers, circles of Bible study, study groups, all of those things. We even say here, we'd rather you not be in rows all the time, but you'd be in circles. That's, it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying there's always another inner circle that maybe we wish we could be a part of. And the problem is this, is whatever circle we're in, there's another circle that looks cooler than that one. So the desire to be included, here's what it does. It leads us to constantly compare our lives with other people. Oh, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough of them. And we've said this over the years. We, we compare our lowlights with other people's highlights. And so we'll find the, the one or two things wrong with our family and then say, well, I'd like to be like that people, not even recognizing all the things that they have wrong as well. But, and then we begin to act different, behave different, speak different, say different things we might not even believe in in order to fit in because of this thing of insignificance. And, and it's easy to walk around feeling in, insignificant on a good day. I mean, that's just easy, peering over the fence, wishing, oh, I wish I could be a part of, of that group. And then you have it even worse because some people will flaunt their position, right? They flaunt their authority. They'll say, well, you don't have what I have. You don't dress like I do. You don't talk what I do. You don't believe the same things I believe, so you can't be a part of our circle. And some people do that. Some people will abuse their authority, in order to put you down and keep you in your place. Some of you have experienced that. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in culture. Maybe it's somewhere, I don't know. But remember what Jesus said, though? He looked at his disciples and he said, that's how the world acts. People in authority, they lord it over other people. That's not how it will be with you. <coughs> he said it this way. It'll be different among you. 
And that's what I want you guys to remember. If you're in authority, if you're in a place of responsibility, you're to act different, you're to be different, you're to be helpful to those around you by serving them. If you don't, you'll end up acting pretty much like everyone we see in our political system right now, right? You're an idiot, you're this, and I can't believe that, and you should move to another country, or whatever we, you know, all the things that we're saying, and it's how we develop an us versus them attitude. And some people on purpose begin to exclude other people. And people are rejected and refused simply because they look different, act different, don't adhere to all the standards, don't line up to everything we believe, so you're out. And that's where it really gets dangerous. It gets dangerous in politics and church and family and business and pretty much everywhere it gets dangerous, right? People with authority start to believe another side doesn't matter and begin to actively work against people. This can happen anywhere. So Jesus is testing the disciples because that's what they're doing. She doesn't matter. Her need doesn't matter, so let's just get rid of her. She's just noise in our ears. Let's get her out of here. <clears throat> so when we're confronted with insignificance, here's what ends up happening. We tend to kind of operate in a couple different ways. One is we get very defensive. And maybe we act out and we get angry and we have frustrations. And, and again, one of the signs of of, of offenses and injustice when something happens and something rises up in us. And, and that's a godly thing. They're like, this needs to be fixed. It shouldn't be like that. But sometimes we can allow that offense just to kind of work through our lives and, and, and it just affects us. I'll just tell you one minor example. My sophomore year of college, I was taking summer classes at North Central University. I went to Evangel taking summer classes in Minneapolis. And there they have all these parking lots. There's like 25 parking lots, it seems like, and you need a special tag to get in one, and it'll get you in ones and not in the others, and it's my first day, and I've got the tag, and I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to park in, and I roll up to campus, and the security guard walking by is a guy I went to high school with, so I said, hey, Paul, this tag, does it work in this lot? And he says, yes, and I'm like, good. But when you look at those, you know, if, if you park here, it's $240 if you don't have the right tag, and I'm like, eh. So anyway, for me at that time, it was 90 because it was like 30 years ago. Anyway, so I go, I go into class, I come out, and my car is gone. It has been towed, and I'm not real happy about it because my friend who works in security said yes. So I went to the lead security office, and, and I walked in, and I said, I'd like to talk to you about something, and the guy never looked up. He just kept writing, and that just made me mad. Then I was ignored, just kind of like Jesus was ignoring. I'm just getting angry. And I'm saying, hey, I have a parking pass. I'm, it's my first day here on campus. Never looks up. I said, your security guard said I could park here. And, and now my car's gone. What should I do? And he doesn't say anything. And I'm just like, oh, this is, guy's a knucklehead. So, and, and, and then I said, and so I repeated the whole thing again. And then I said, I don't think I should have to pay for this because I was told by your team, and I'm going to sit here all afternoon because my dad's not around, I don't have a ride, I just don't think I should have to pay for this. And he looked, then the first time he looked up and all he said was, that's not my problem, it's yours. And he, and he went back and just basically dismissed me. I was just made to feel this big, and, and, and I remember thinking, I don't like you at all, <laughs> at all. So I told my brother this story a couple months ago, and, and he said, uh, oh, that guy, man, he's doing a great job in ministry now. And I'm like, I don't think we have the right guy. <laughs> I mean, you could tell me, you know, he, he, he's feeding the poor everywhere. And I'd be like, no, he's a terrible person. Because someone makes you feel that way, you just you never get over it, it doesn't feel like. And I've kind of had to check, I still get a little angry thinking about it right now. So <laughs> to feel this way a little bit. So... That's one thing. We get defensive and we start getting angry and we start lashing out at people and we're like, ah, because I don't like how I'm feeling. And we can sometimes begin to walk through life that way. Another thing we can tend to do is we can tend to, if we feel that way over and over and we begin to rehearse it, we begin to, you have that at home and you have it in another place and you have it you know, at school and you start to believe the lie that you don't matter and then you live as if it's true. And we have a lot of people in our world that do that right now. They have been told some, something has held them back. Something has, has not worked out for them. They, maybe they got in prison or in drugs and there's so much to overcome, not just in their personal life, but out in the world and, and all these things. And, and now they're like, I don't think I matter 
because people tell me I don't matter, and now I even believe it that way, and, and we're insignificant, we feel that way, and we feel everyone else has worth, but I don't. And then we lived our life based on that prism of information. So I want you to, to think about this just, just for a minute. And in Scripture, the heroes of the faith that we have, you can name them, virtually all of them walked with this feeling of insignificance in their life. In fact, let me just share a couple with you. Moses, God says, I want you to lead my people, two million people, out of slavery, and you're the guy I'm choosing. And he says, you got the wrong guy. I can't talk very well. I, I can't do this job. I think of, of David. David's going to be the first king of Israel, and Samuel comes and says, hey, let's bring your whole line up, all your kids, because one of them's going to be the king, and his dad doesn't even remember that David's even an option, leaves him out in the field, and he says, do you have any more kids? He says, yeah, I got this scrawny one out here, but he's not the guy you're looking for, and he brings him in, and, and he's the one. David's own family doesn't recognize the greatness in him. I go to Gideon. Gideon, the angel shows up and says, mighty warrior, and he's like, What? He says, I'm the, my family's the tiniest family in the least clan. You got the wrong guy. All of them had a calling of God on their life, and yet their feelings of insecurity, inferiority, and significance told them to believe, I can't do what you've asked me to do, even though God himself is showing up. I just believe God has a call on every single one of our lives this morning that's here, whether you're watching at home, whether you're here, and he has a plan for you, but sometimes we're our own worst enemy, and we feel, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too this, I'm too that. I can't do that. And God's like, wait a second, listen to what I'm telling you. Don't believe the lie and live as if it's true that you are insignificant. All of them shrank back initially from the calling God had them. They had to work through this tendency, and it's easy to do that, but God wants us to have another way. So I want to talk to you about the other side of feeling insignificant. If you're feeling that way and walking through that, it's it's because there's been some kind of, someone's told you that, someone's put you on that, that on you, and there can be feelings that way. So I want to talk about the other side of this, because what if there's another thing that God wants to say to you? in this moment. Here's what I'd like you to do is this. I'd like you to consider another point of view, to consider another point of view. Pastor Todd, come on up here. I'm going to use you for a minute up here and abuse you. No, I won't uh, use you. I'm going to. So we need to have a different vantage point. So you just stand there. I've got my glasses on, but I'm going to, I'm going to use this as, as an example. So I have glasses. Todd actually has glasses. He doesn't always wear LASIKs. them. You have what? LASIKs. You did LASIK? Okay, we'll talk about that later. Sorry. <laughs> I remember you wearing some sweet old glass. Stand up here, so they can, but not too close because we've got rules. We've got to follow. All right. So, offenses are, are like lenses, and I just want to show you this. I, I, I think so, so I've got my glasses here, and, and let's say I came in today and, and Todd just totally ignores me because he thinks he's superior to me because he's got a Green Bay Packers shirt on, and my Vikings are, are terrible. And, and so my lens is going to tell me Todd thinks he's better than he ignored. We walked right past each other. It's 830. There's not even people in the building. He walks in. He walks past me. And I'm like, Todd, and we've been together 19 years. What is your, what's his problem today? And, then he, and you could do that. Maybe it's someone you don't know. And you, you put on the lens and you say, they think they're better than me. They, they're, they've got things going. And, and you start conjuring things in your mind. You're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be this good guy. And everyone likes him. But I don't know if I like him because he's ignoring. He's just done some, you, know, you didn't talk to me. It didn't, it didn't happen. But I'm, I'm getting into it too much here. So anyway, all right. So that's how I look at it. But for him... Maybe here's what happened. Again, didn't happen. Maybe he walked in, and he gets a text from Deb saying, hey, I've got to rush one of the kids to the emergency room because they got 105 feeder. And then he's like, oh, no. And then I have to do the offering today, and then, then i got to speak downstairs in a couple minutes. And so when he walked by me, he, wasn't even, he didn't even know I was there, but I'm offended at him, right? So I got my glasses on. What's wrong with Todd? Then Todd later sees me, and I'm like giving him the old stink guy, like, Oh, man, this guy doesn't like me. And then he puts, don't put these on, but he puts on his own lenses, and he's like, well, what's wrong with Jason? He's a pastor of the church, and now he's angry at me. Should have I worn this shirt? Am I going to get fired tomorrow? You know, what is all this stuff going on here? And then, and so now we come to work tomorrow, and we're both kind of like, I don't know, what happened here? Well, that's what happens with offense. We start to put a lens on that's not true. And so we got to be careful of that because we can end up thinking things about other people that are not true. We live in a culture that says this, you need to see it your way, right? 
And then we think our point of view validates us because I'm offended, that's my point of view, I have a right to do that, but here's the deal. Because I see it one way doesn't mean I'm right. It just means I've got some lenses on that are telling me that's how it happened. Because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. It's just the way you see it. So we need to be careful of that. We need to look at it from another point of view. Good job standing there. All right, thanks, Todd. Oh, yeah, give it up for him. So offenses are like lenses. So when offenses come, here's another thing we need to do. We need to remember what God has to say about us. What does God have to say about you? One thing real quick there is pray first, don't post. So if something's got you liared up, liared up, liared up, whatever it is, pray about it before you post it. Some of us are just posting stuff we've never even prayed about. Now we have all this stuff we're dealing with. We've got to be careful here. So here, here's what I'm saying. We need God's perspective. So, I am walk through life, I'm offended because somebody does something, somebody says something, someone looks at me weird, and instead of just going off, instead of assuming all these things, here's what I'm saying is, God, what do you have to say about this situation? God, this is how I'm seeing it, but is that reality? So you come to the Lord and say, God, would you give me your perspective, your heart for this situation? Because I'm feeling this way right now, but I don't know that I have all the facts, so Lord, Give me clarity, give me humility because I'm offended doesn't mean I'm right right now. Praying about it also keeps me from shrinking back because sometimes as we hear some things, we begin to own them and then it begins to, when I'm in God's presence, he can tell me things about myself that I wouldn't believe in other places. I'll believe the truth from him versus the lie from myself. So when I think how he sees me, I stop then viewing myself with a lens of insecurity because some of us, that insignificance is just that's how we think everyone's viewing us. And God wants you to know, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And if anyone ever says you're insignificant or you feel that way about yourself, you need to know that is a lie from the pit of hell because guess what? Jesus on purpose came to die for you. Came to die for you. Somebody thought you were so important that he came to die for you. So he saw such value in you that he left heaven to die for you. Ephesians says this, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. It's what he wanted to do. God wanted it. Jesus wanted to do it. He was a willing participant in this. And it gave them, gave him great pleasure. Why? Because you are worth something. You're valuable. Greg Ford said this, Satan likes to turn micro-truths into macro-lies. So let's turn those around. Micro-truths, I got that wrong, into macro-lies. What? Jill needs to help me. <laughs> All right, okay, here we go. Here's, well, whatever that means, here's what, it, here's what we say. I got a bad grade, so that means I'm stupid. All right? Or... Or I'm, my parents are disappointed in me, and that turns into a, a lie in that my parents don't love me. We begin to do that in, in places. Let me remind, remind you this morning, our limitations do not point to insignificance. Our weaknesses do not point to insignificance. Here's the deal. They just point to our humanity in need of a Savior. Reflection question, and I'm done. What if God wants you to stay on mission and develop a new way of thinking when you feel insignificant, when you feel that you don't matter. Well, for some of us, what if God wants to give you a mission that you haven't received yet? And then when you're like, man, I don't know if I can do this, develop in you a new way of thinking when you have these feelings in your life. So as we close, look at what she does. The disciples, they don't see what's going on. They're like, yeah, Jesus, you go get them now. Let her have it. Put her in her place. She's not in our group. She isn't worthy of our time and attention. But what he is doing is actually engaging with her. And she sees for the first time in her life a rabbi actually engage with her, and I think she knows he has a chance. And her response is, basically, I understand that you're not here for me, but I've got your attention right now, and I'm not going to waste it. And look at what she does. Her response is to stay close to Jesus. And then check this out. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. She doesn't leave. She doesn't walk away because of her offense. She just gets in closer. Now, here's what I have found. Anytime I'm feeling insignificant, anytime I'm feeling offended, when I get in the Lord's presence, something begins to change. 
when I worship him. He can tell me things that, that I, I hadn't been aware of before. I can start to feel, you know, I, I may like, man, this is the worst, it's all this stuff, but I get in God's presence and I get a new perspective. I begin to understand that he's for me, not against me. And there's something miraculous that's about to happen in her life. We'll look at that next week. I'm gonna have you stand with me and we're gonna go just, just a couple minutes more. I know we try to have an hour during COVID season here. But I want you just to worship for a second. Because if you're feeling insignificant, the best place I think that you can be is in God's presence. The best place that you can be is just at his feet and saying, God, I'm just here for a minute or two just to worship you. And here's what I found. My circumstances may not change, but when my perspective does, everything changes up here. And then sometimes God whispers a miracle into my life. And actually, there's healing, and there's something that happened that goes deep. So this morning, right where we're at, we're just going to sing through a chorus or, or two one time of this song, just the, the, the first couple verses, and, and just say, God, I need you. Where do you need him this morning? Where do you need him? Maybe where are you feeling a little bit less than? Or maybe you, you've kind of come up against some people, and you're like, man, I kind of got railroaded through this situation, and, and my attitude's all over the map, but I need to get right, my heart right, so I can respond to other people in the right way. So God, I come to you, whatever your need is, maybe it's physical, maybe it's spiritual, relational. God, I come to you as this lady did, and I come to you, and I might feel all these things, where are you? I don't understand all this stuff, but God, I'm just gonna worship you just for a couple moments and ask that you would meet me in this place, in this moment, because God, I need you more than anything else. So would you worship with us this morning as we close with this song? Let's just kind of stay here for a second. Father, thank you that you are right here for us. Here in this room, you're right there with those joining us online. You are here for us always, every moment of every hour of every day. Lord, maybe there's one who just needs to commit to you and, and to recognize your commitment to them and come into relationship with you, Jesus, or renew that relationship. And it's just as simple and as profoundly meaningful as recognizing you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. Jesus, please forgive us of our sins. Thank you that you take us just as we are. 
and that you make us new. Lord, please cleanse us. And Father, just as a church family, we need your cleansing, God. We need your cleansing from lies. That little thing that we have believed that has become this big thing, and it really isn't even true. Father, would we believe the truth that you created every one of us and you love us? Lord, I was such a mess when that became real to me. And Lord, still so many times, different mess <laughs> and just a mess. And thank you that you just pick us up right there and hold us closely. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that that would be just a little bit more real, even now, God, that you see us and you love us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to start our dismissal um, in just a moment. But God wants you to know the truth is that you matter. You matter. You matter. You matter to him. You matter to us. You matter to so many. And we love you and are praying for you. Um, we are just so thankful that you have joined us for part of your day today. And for those of you who are new, maybe you have still have questions about what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Please text BELIEVE to the number 97000. We will connect with you and give you resources. Maybe you're just new to the Evangel family. Welcome. We want to get to know you. So please text NEW EC for Evangel Church to the number 97000, and we will connect with you. So with that, friends online, we just love you so much. If you have kiddos that are going to be with us next week, please register them starting at noon today through Thursday. And um, whatever life is thrown at you right now, we love you and we're praying for you. God knows your name. He knows where you're at. And we are so grateful that you've joined us for part of your day. God bless you.